This evening I'm here to share my story with you. It is my childhood experiences during World War II in the concentration camps. I will tell you about our liberation and how we finally started our lives anew in our blessed United States of America. Mine is a story that Anne Frank might have told had she survived. And as all of you know, Anne Frank was a young Jewish girl who died along with most of her family in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. This is also a story that conveys a message of perseverance, determination, faith, and above all hope. Life in the early 1930s in Germany was very much for my family, as it is here for most of you today. Never did we think that the anti-Semitic incidents there would ever lead to very much. My father was in a successful shoe business in a small town. My parents, two-year-older brother and I, lived comfortably with my grandparents above the shoe store. Life for Jews was made increasingly more difficult, and in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were formulated and enforced. The following are just some of the many restrictions imposed on the Jews in Germany. Jews were not allowed into theaters, into parks, or into swimming pools. All public schools were close to Jewish children. Then there was an evening curfew for the Jews. Jews were only allowed to shop during specific hours of the day, and non-Jews were not allowed to shop in Jewish-owned stores. Non-Jews were just not allowed to associate with Jewish people. And then, a big letter J for Jew was stamped on ID cards and on passports. These restrictions went on and on, and it was then that my parents decided to make arrangements to leave the country. My grandparents, who were in the late 70s and ill, refused to leave their home. They could not understand the urgency or the necessity of doing so. My grandparents passed away in 1938, just 11 days within each other. And soon thereafter, we received our necessary papers for our immigration to America. I was just four years old at that time. November 9, 1938, Kristallnacht, or Crystal Night. It was the night of broken glass when the Nazis and their many followers smashed the windows and the storefronts of Jewish-owned stores. Jewish establishments, synagogues, and Jewish books were burned and destroyed. This was the beginning of a massive program against the Jews in Germany, a massive verbal and physical assault against all German Jews. In reality, this was the beginning of the Holocaust. On November 12th, following Kristallnacht, the German government actually fined the Jewish population for the damage caused that night. These imposed taxes were used to rearm Germany. The night of Kristallnacht, our apartment was ransacked. All valuables were thrown into a pillowcase and taken away. But worst of all was that they transported my father to concentration camp Buchenwald in Germany. All sorts of terrible stories were related to my mother, and we did not know if we'd ever see my father again. He was released after three weeks, only because our papers were in order for our emigration to America. And to think that just a few years prior, he had been awarded the Iron Cross for his military service in the German army of World War I. We were forced to sell both our home and our business for a fraction of its worth. And soon thereafter, in January of 1939, we left for Holland from where we were to sail to the United States. And for almost nine months, while awaiting our quota number from the American State Department, my parents were assigned to take care of some 125 children. These young children had been sent by their parents from various parts of Europe to escape from the Nazis. In December of that year, 1939, we were deported to the detention camp of Westerbork in Holland to await our departure day to America. 
Camp Festival was constructed by the Dutch to accommodate Jews from various parts of Europe. In May of 1940, just one month before our planned departure date, the Germans invaded Holland and we were trapped. All of our belongings, which were about to be loaded on board ship, were burned and destroyed as the harbor of Rotterdam was bombed. Under Dutch control, Camp Festival was tolerable. My mother, father, brother, and I shared two small rooms. We all ate in a communal dining room, and at that time, there was enough food for us so that we did not go hungry. Adults were assigned to various work duties. My father worked to repair shoes. My mother worked in the kitchen. We children had a makeshift education and lived a very dull, stagnant life. Several months later, when the Nazi SS took over the command of Westerbork, we became acquainted with the ever-present, terrifying, 12-foot high barbed wire. And as thousands of Jews were rounded up, many taken from their hiding places, as was Anne Frank and her family, Camp Westerbork became overcrowded. And it was at that time that we had to share our small quarters with another family. And then the dreadful transports to the concentration and extermination camps in Eastern Europe began. This started in early 1942. And from then on, every Monday night, lists of those to be deported were posted, causing incredible anxiety, anguish, and fear. And then on Tuesday mornings, men, women, and little ones were marched to a nearby railroad platform from where they were transported. This area became known as Boulevard de Misere. It was an area of complete misery. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, the trains left for their destination. And of the total 120,000 men, women, and children that departed Westerbork, 102,000 were doomed never to return. In January of 1944, it was our turn to be shipped out. We children were actually glad for a change of environment. We were very naive, and we welcomed the move. We were allowed to take one knapsack each, and whatever we could stuff into it, we were permitted to take. When we approached the railroad platform and we saw the cattle cars in which we were to travel, our fears began to mount. Adults suspected, and they somehow knew what was in store for us. I remember that it was a bitter cold, pitch black, rainy night when we arrived at our destination, concentration camp Bergen-Belsen in Joss, and greeted by the German guards who were shouting at us and threatening us with their weapons and with the most vicious attack dogs by their sides. I was a very frightened nine-year-old, and to this day, I still feel a certain sense of fear whenever I see a German shepherd. Bergen-Belsen was divided into various areas. It was sectioned off and surrounded by electrified barbed wire. Guards were always in strategically placed high guard towers, and in the evenings, as soon as it would turn dark, the bright searchlights from above would constantly sweep the campgrounds. We were placed in a section that was known as the Stern Lager, or the Star Camp, named so because we had to continue wearing that yellow star which had been issued to us back in Holland. Men were on one side of the camp and the women on the other. And this did make it possible at times for families to get a glimpse of one another. We were placed in this particular section of the camp with the hope of being exchanged for German nationals um, in Palestine who were under British house arrest because they were um, citizens of an enemy country. This hope, of course, never materialized for our family. 600 of us, 600 of our people were crammed into each 
of the crude wooden heatless barracks, meant for 100 when originally built. There were triple decker bunk beds with two people sharing each bunk. German <coughs> winters were bitter cold and very long. We were given only one thin blanket per bunk and a straw filled mattress. And this bunk was our only living quarters, and that for two people. I was very lucky that I was able to share a bunk with my mother, and that my brother was able to share a bunk with our father. But can you imagine two adults, two strangers, sharing a bunk under such horrendous conditions? A bunk that was no larger than the small cot bed that we're all so familiar with. I remember the first time seeing a wagon filled with what I thought was firewood for the one small oven that we had in our barrack. That oven, of course, was never used. I soon realized that what was in the wagon were dead, naked bodies thrown one on top of the other. Toilets and so-called washing facilities were at a great distance in the most primitive outhouses. Toilets were long wooden benches with holes cut into them, one next to the other. There was no privacy, there was no toilet paper, there was no soap, and hardly ever any water with which to wash. And in the almost year and a half that we were in Wagen Belsen, never once were we able to brush our teeth. There were no trees, no flowers, nor did we ever see a blade of grass. And whenever it rained, we had to slosh through the mud, adding even more misery to our already dismal existence. Every morning, every single morning, without fail, we were ordered to line up on a huge field. It was called an Appellplatz, five in a row as we were counted. We would have to stand there until each and every one of us was accounted for, often from early morning till late at night, without food, without water, no matter what the weather, without protective clothing. Frostbite was common. We would treat our affected toes and fingers with the warmth of our own urine. Our diet, consisted of a slice of bread a day, some hot watery soup with grizzly meats and turnips and potato peels. Then it was later cut back and given to us just once a week and only if our so-called quarters were neat and in order. Our birthday present to one another was that little piece of bread that we had saved up from the previous week. Once a month, we were marched to an area to shower. And there, under the watchful eyes of the guards, we were ordered to undress. We had heard about exterminations and gas chambers in other areas of Europe, and we therefore were never sure when the faucets were turned on as to what would come out, water or gas. The Nazis did their utmost to break us physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Unfortunately, they did succeed with many of our people. It was not uncommon for people who were no longer responsible for their actions to attempt escape, even though they knew that their chance to succeed was next to impossible. But they also felt that they had nothing more to lose. The failure of their attempts were obvious when we saw their lifeless bodies hanging electrocuted against the barbed wire. Malnutrition, dysentery, and the loss of the will to go on is what destroyed body and mind. Death was an everyday occurrence. The dark crowded quarters often caused us to trip and fall over the dead. Bodies could not be taken away fast enough. We as children saw things that no one, no matter what the age, should ever have to see. I know, of course, that you've all heard, you've read, you've studied, you might have seen movies, perhaps even two documentaries about the Holocaust. But the constant foul odor, the filth, continuous horror, and fear surrounded by death is indescribable. There is no way that this can be put accurately into words or pictures. 
Our bodies, hair, and clothes were infested with lice. We learned that there was a distinct difference between head lice and clothes lice. Squashing them between my thumbnails became my primary pastime. Much of my time was taken up with make-believe games, and one game, a game based on superstition, became very important to me. I decided that if I were to find four pebbles of about the same size and shape, that that would mean that the four members of my family would all survive. My mother, my father, my brother, and I. It was a torturous, painful, very difficult game to play. What if I couldn't find the third or fourth pebble? Might that mean that one or two of my family members would not survive? Nevertheless, this game gave me something to hold on to, some distant hope. After a number of months on our meager diets, our stomach shrunk so that the hunger was no longer painful. Teenagers and men suffered most for malnutrition and were the first to die. Those who lasted the longest were the women, and mothers in particular. It was their strong will to keep their children alive that kept them going. And my mother was one of those remarkable ladies. There is no doubt in my mind that it was my mother's inner strength and fortitude that finally saw us through. One day, my mother was able to smuggle some potatoes and some salt from the kitchen where she worked. Using an empty can as a pot and pieces from the wooden slats from our bunk as firewood, my mother somehow managed to cook some soup in secret. This was done on our bunk. I was on the bunk with her, trying to hide and shield what she was doing. Soup was simmering, just about finished, when the German guards entered our barrack for surprise inspection. And in our rush to hide that setup, the boiling soup spilled on my leg. We had been taught self-discipline and self-control the hard way, for I knew for sure that if I had cried out, it would have cost us our lives. This happened in the spring of 1945. I was just 10 years old. The population in Camp Bag and Belgium was dying off rapidly, but not nearly fast enough to satisfy the Nazis. Several weeks later, it was decided to send three trainloads of our people to Eastern Europe towards the extermination camps and the gas chambers. We did not know that Auschwitz, with its gas chambers, had already been liberated. My family was among the 2,500 on the last of these three trains. It was April of 1945, Russian army was closing in from the Northeast, and the British and the Americans from the West. Under normal conditions, this train ride from Bag and Belton to whatever area of Eastern Europe they were going to send us would have taken no more than 10 hours. But because the Germans tried to evade the Allies, we were on route for two long weeks without food, without water, without medical supplies, without sanitary facilities. That meant no toilets. Whenever the train come, came to a stop, those who were able and those who were strong enough were permitted to get out and take a drink from a nearby stream or dig up roots to eat. My mother remembered taking some sort of a pot and collecting water from the locomotive. <coughs> and who knows what else that pot was used. It's almost more important than food because of the severe dehydration due to the dysentery and the high fever due to the typhus. Let me briefly explain typhus. It is a highly contagious, deadly disease that's caused from filth and spread by lice. At the same time, while the train was at a standstill, the newly dead were taken off and buried along the tracks. In addition, our train was subject to frequent air attacks by the Allies. It is truly remarkable how any one of us was able to survive under such horrendous conditions. In fact, 500 of our people, that's one out of every five, died on route or shortly thereafter. My burnt leg was severely infected, and it was impossible to keep the wound clean or lice-free. In late April, 
After 14 days of this surreal and horrifying journey, the German guards stormed frantically through the train, seeking civilian clothing so that they would not be recognized by the Allies. And we knew then that the war was coming to an end. It was the Russian army that liberated our train and led us to a nearby farm village in eastern Germany. Most of the inhabitants had fled, and we took over their homes. Kitchens were stocked with ample food. It was rich and good, actually much too good for our stock bodies. We could not tolerate that unfamiliar nourishment. And at that time, at the age of 10 and a half, I weighed 16 kilos, or as we know it here, 35 pounds. And my mother, a mere 70 pounds. The Russians, in a crude way, tried to help us the best that they could. I was brought to a nearby clinic for medical attention. My leg was in very bad condition, and I was close to losing it. Fortunately, it was decided to treat the wound, and I was very lucky that my leg responded to medication, and it gradually healed. As I regained my strength, I also learned to walk. And in the interim, our heads were shaved because that was the only way that we could rid ourselves of head lice. Although we were all weak, ill, and thoroughly exhausted, I vividly remember the spring of 1945. Weather was beautiful, sunny and bright, trees and grass were lush and green, flowers were blue, birds were singing. It was a wonderful, exciting feeling to be free at long last. We were all ill with typhus, but my father had to die from it. Six weeks after our liberation, and this after six and a half years of mental torment and physical abuse. My 12-year-old brother, Albert, actually helped bury our father. When I talk about those years, it is as though I'm relating a nightmare, a very bad dream. I separate myself from it ever having happened to me, and that is how I deal with it. It is a wonderful story of how we gradually recuperated and were sent back to Harlem to start our lives anew. My brother and I were eventually placed in the children's home in preparation to live in what was then British-controlled Palestine, and we know today as Israel. Most of the children in this home survived alone, without their parents. I felt like a total misfit. I needed to learn how to be settled into a normal society. Had no training for that. Here I was by this time, 11 years old. Had never been in a store. Had no idea what money was all about. Had almost no table manners. It was like learning to live all over again. It was in this home that we became reacquainted with life in its normal state. Meals served us were delicious and nourishing. And you can imagine that just about anything and everything tasted good to us. And though our surrogate parents provided a very strict environment, much love and care were given us. I began my first formal education at that time at the age of 11 and a half. We were taught the secular subjects, reading, writing, arithmetic, in a Montessori school where we progressed at our own pace. The Dutch language in which we're taught was all new to us. We also received a thorough education in Hebrew and in religious studies. The British, who were governing Palestine in the 1940s, had issued what was known as the White Paper, restricting the number of Jews permitted into the land. They were intercepting many of the refugee ships and interning the survivors on the island of Cyprus and in some cases, turning the ships back to Europe. In November of 1947, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine between Arabs and Jews, which in May of 1948 led to the establishment of the State of Israel. In 1947, just one year prior to Israel becoming a state, our illegal voyage from Holland to Palestine was planned and danger once again loomed over us. 
And because parents at that time were not permitted to accompany their children, my mother managed to make arrangements for a family of three to emigrate to the United States. And thanks to the Holland America Line, we were able to use the tickets which had been purchased 10 years earlier. We arrived in Hoboken, New Jersey, April 23rd, 1948. By coincidence, exactly three years to the day of our liberation. It was a Jewish relief organization, the Hayas, that found a home for us in Peoria, Illinois. Never heard of Illinois, definitely not Peoria. And there, at the age of 13, I once again started life anew in a strange land and again learning a new language, my third new language in less than three years. First Dutch, then Hebrew, and now English. And because of my inability to speak English, I, at the age of 13, was placed in the fourth grade with nine year olds. Although both my brother and I worked long hours after school to help our mom pay bills, I nevertheless found time, I actually made time, to take extra courses during the year, attend summer school, and by working very hard in my studies, I was able to be graduated from Peoria Central High School five years later at age 18, ranking eighth in a class of 267 students. It was two months after high school graduation that I was married to Nathaniel Lazan, who I had met at the age of 16 in Peoria. And God willing, we'll be celebrating our 66th wedding anniversary this coming August. Nathaniel, where are you? I can't even see you. And that I survived healthy in body, mind, and spirit, and that together with my husband, by the way, he deserved every bit of that applause and then some. Um, we are so grateful. We have three grown children, all three are happily married, and they've given us nine beautiful grandchildren and five extraordinary, magnificent, great grandchildren. Amazing, amazing. And in March, it is amazing. And in March of 1996, my memoir, Four Perfect Petals, co authored by Lila Pearl, was published by Green Barrel Division of HarperCollins. It is now in its 30th printing in hardback, so that told us. Has been published by HarperCollins for the 20th anniversary edition. This is the 20th anniversary edition, and I don't like this cover. And, uh, but they were in charge, and that's it. Must be that barbed wire that's still getting to me. Whatever. And uh, <laughs> available from Scholastic Book Club, has been translated in German and in Dutch, came out in Hebrew. Now they did a super job. And if you like, and I know that you have students here who are able to read it in Japanese. So you see that despite all the terrible things that happened to me as a child, my life today is full and rewarding. Above all, I'm so grateful that the story is in book form so that it can be passed on to future generations. And I'm thrilled that a documentary has been made entitled Marion's Triumph with the actress Deborah Messing as the narrator. Although I've spoken to upward of a million and a half students and adults over these past 20 some years, it still has not become easy. However, I do realize the importance of sharing that period of our history with you, simply because in a few short years, we will not be here any longer to give a first hand account. I therefore ask you to please, please share my story or any of the Holocaust stories that you read and hear about. Share them with your friends. Share them with your relatives. And someday, someday share them with your children. And yes, even with your grandchildren. When we're not here any longer, it is you who will have to bear with
witness. As difficult as it is, the horror of the Holocaust must be taught, must be studied, and kept alive. Only then can we guard it from ever happening again. This, this is the very yellow star that I was forced to wear. It says Jude, which in German means Jew. It was just another way to denigrate us, to isolate us, and to set us apart from the rest of society. This represents a star of David, a beautiful, meaningful Jewish symbol. But the Nazis made it so very ugly. Each of us, each and every one of us, must do everything in our power to prevent such hatred, such destruction, and such terror from reoccurring. And we can begin by having love, respect, and tolerance, and compassion towards one another, regardless of the religious belief, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of the national origin. This respect towards one another must begin in our homes, around the kitchen table, dining room table, wherever we gather as a family. We, the adults, must pass it on our places of business. You, the students, in your classrooms, in the halls of your school, communities, towns, cities, and only if there's respect and compassion and tolerance towards one another in the countries can we expect to have peace in the world. We must begin with you, the students. We must begin with our children. Let us treat people as individuals. Let us look for similarities and respect the differences. Let us build bridges and reach out towards one another. And we must be true to ourselves and not blindly follow a leader without thinking ahead and searching our hearts and our minds as to what the consequences might be. It is not cool to follow just anyone's lead without first checking to see what his or her true intentions are. Please remember these messages. Share them with your friends who are unable to be here this evening. Share them, remember them, but above all, let us all live by them. We are all aware, or we should be, that six million Jewish people were murdered during the Holocaust of the Second World War. The population of the state of Massachusetts is approximately 6,700,000. Can you possibly imagine almost the entire population of Massachusetts wiped out? The six million also represent one third of the entire pre-World War II Jewish population. Among them were one and a half million children. Children just like you. We also need to remember that there were five million non-Jews who lost their lives. Among them were the righteous Gentiles, as we refer to them, very special people. Non-Jews who jeopardized their lives to save Jewish families. They would hide them in the attics, they would hide them in the basements, farmers would hide them out in the barns, they were hidden in convents, and when these good people were caught doing what they thought was the right thing to do, they also were deported to concentration camps, and in many cases lost their lives. And that brings me to another message. We must never generalize and judge an entire group by the actions of some within that group. These are all universal messages, messages that each and every one of us is familiar with to varying degrees, but need to be reminded of over and over again. And this certainly was a good opportunity to do so. These messages are the lessons learned from that dark period of our history and certainly apply to today's world situation and definitely to our own individual lives. By listening, I hope that you prevent our past from becoming your future. 
I now need to share, I want to share something special with you about a very extraordinary lady, my mom. This was my mother on her 104th birthday. Sadly, mom passed away a few years ago, six weeks short of 105. Amazing, amazing lady. Took one medication for high blood pressure. I decided long ago that Tylenol is not a medication. <laughs> when, um, we, let's put mom right here for you all to admire. When we would be home, when we would be home, and home for us is the South Shore of Long Island in New York, we would see my mom all the time. She only lived 20 minutes from us in her own apartment with help towards the end. And when we would travel, and oh my goodness, do we travel, end of October, November, beginning December, six round trip flights in eight weeks. That's a lot of schlepping. And, and when we would travel, we would speak to my mother several times a day. And that reminds me that you too check in with your moms, even though they live in Korea or in, in, in uh, wherever you guys are from all over the place. I know. So check in with them every so often. They need to know all about you, that you're doing well and, and, uh, and what you're doing. You guys all over to them. Okay? Okay. Um, my brother, and this is going to be still difficult, my brother passed away uh, a year ago this past January, and so I have to talk about him in the past. Albert dealt with this altogether differently than I did. He lived in California, was happily married, but by choice did not bring children into this world. Had a very difficult time with organized religion. All of that made me very sad. But I didn't fault Albert. We have to remember, he was two years older than I am, was with my father in the men's section, and I'm convinced that he saw and experienced things that I did not. God puts us on this earth. Gives us a beautiful mind. It is this mind that allows us to choose right from wrong, good from evil. We are capable of making choices. Therefore, men did this to one another. But did he have to make it so bitterly cold when we were standing out there on a pell all day? I have a direct line, ask loads of questions, don't get too many answers, but that's okay. Faith I will always have. After all, here I am, three children, nine grandchildren, five great-grandchildren from whom generations will be forthcoming. He made sure that enough of us survived so that we will always be here. I am proud of my faith, as I'm certain you are proud of your faith and of your heritage. But please, please, let us all remember to respect the right of others to their belief. Be kind and good and respectful and tolerant and compassionate towards one another. That is the basis for peace. Had there been respect and tolerance towards one another some 70, 80 years ago, I would not be here this evening to share that dark period of our history with you. 9-11 would not have occurred. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, North Korea, all these countries that are in such turmoil would be peaceful countries for its people. Be kind and good and respectful towards one another, please. It is such a simple message, and yet so difficult to achieve. There is very little that we can do against the negativity in our world. But how we treat, behave, and reach out towards one another, that is entirely up to us. Did I ever find my four pebbles? Frequently asked question. I always found my four pebbles. I made it my business to find them. I cheated all the time. 
When I found them, I put them in a safe place. Next time I would search for them, and I couldn't find that third one or that fourth one, well, I knew exactly where to go and pick them up. Maybe there was cheating, but it was my game, and guess who made the rules? <laughs> you need to know that I was only about nine or 10 years old when things were at its absolute worst. We had nothing to occupy our time with constructively. No paper, no pencils, no books, certainly no games. So I was lucky at such an imaginative mind, and my imaginative games were always based on a positive attitude. I would search for a piece of glass, or a piece of a mirror, whatever I could find on the dirt ground and bag and belt, and, and when the sun would shine, and that didn't happen nearly often enough in that part of Germany, known for bad weather and cloudy skies, but I, Marion, knew that that sun would always come out. And when it did, that little piece of glass would cast a reflection onto the ground. And that little wiggly reflection, it became my pet. As long as the sun would shine, I would have my pet, and my pet would never, ever die. I would also imagine that one day, once again, would have my three bees. And these three bees represent our everyday comforts and necessities that we all take so much for granted. First B represented a bed. I knew that someday I once again would have my very own bed with a real mattress, clean sheets, and enough blankets to keep me warm. Second B represented a bath, warm water, soap, clean towel, and with that would come toothpaste and a toothbrush, of course. And the third B was bread. I knew that someday I once again would have enough bread so that I would never again go hungry. These imaginative games, if you will, they were my survival techniques. They were my survival skills. Do you know that we all have survival techniques and skills within us? When the need arises, we just have to search for them, find them, and be sure that we put them to work. No one is spared adversity. No one is spared hardship. We all have to overcome obstacles at one time or another. But with perseverance, with determination, with faith, and above all hope, one can overcome just about anything and everything. Above all, never ever give up hope. It is not so much what happens to a person, it's how we deal with the situation that makes the difference. I came to America, let's see how much time I have, I was told. I came to America and I got acquainted with potato chips. <laughs> and whoever was eating them was dipping in something white and creamy. I didn't know from dips, so I was so sure that there was mayonnaise. Well, I couldn't wait to get my own big bag of potato chips and my own jar of mayonnaise. And oh my goodness, did that do a job on me quickly became a big 13-year-old, and there I was with this little nine-year-old. She knew that could have been plenty fun of me. I looked differently than they did, definitely acted differently than they did. But I need you to know that they were so good to me. They helped me with my homework, included me in their games. I hope that when a new student comes into your class, in your school, that you too help him or her to adjust to a new situation. Put yourself in his or her place, how you might feel if you're placed in a strange and new environment. Be kind and good and respectful towards one another. And you, the students here at the Groton School, you are so fortunate to be receiving a good education in a magnificent environment with dedicated teachers and headmaster and, and your language department is, is outstanding. Do not take your educational opportunities for granted. Make the most of it. Give your studies an extra measure of hard work. You will never, ever regret it. Nathan is from New York. He went to Bradley University in Peoria, lucky me. He went home on vacations, and way back then, long distance telephone calls were very expensive. There were no computers, there were no emails, but for a three cent stamp, and there really was such a thing as a three cent stamp, we would write to one another every single day. Major problems. 
In his letters to me, he would add five words, Nathaniel, where are you? There was more than five words, at least 15 words that you asked me to define and put into a sentence. That's a lot of nerve with all I had to do, but I knew he meant to help me with my English, and I guess it did work, so thank you, Nathaniel. I, on the other hand, would write my letters in rough draft, with a dictionary by my side, and only when I was satisfied with the way the letter was written would I dare mail it to him. Talking about a dictionary, my father always carried a little chunky German English dictionary with him, and he would study the vocabulary in secret whenever possible, always with the hope that someday he would reach America. When we came to the United States back in 1948 and approached New York Harbor, we were told the night before that if we wanted to see the Statue of Liberty, we needed to be on deck bright and early the next morning. Well, you can be sure that each and every one of us was on deck to greet and be greeted by that magnificent symbol of freedom, the freedom that had been denied us for so many years. And to this day, when we crossed the Verrazano Bridge, this area of Massachusetts, and you all may need an explanation. Anyway, the Verrazano Bridge is a long bridge in New York that connects the borough of Staten Island. When we reach a certain point on that bridge, I will always crave my neck to see the Statue of Liberty, most magnificent, beautiful, meaningful sight. We've returned to Germany on various occasions. Um, the first time was back in 1995. It was the 50th anniversary of our liberation. And we visited my father's grave. And the reason my father and about 60 others had a private resting place in that farm village where we were liberated was because they died after some of the chaos had subsided. Those who died early on were all buried in mass graves. We went to Bag and Bells, and Bag and Bells looks nothing the way I remember. But it had been burned down on the direction of President Eisenhower, who was then the commander of the Allied forces, because the conditions of the camp would have created tremendous health hazards for that entire region of Germany. So today, other than the newly built documentation exhibition centers, back in Belgium, looks like a park. Green grass shrubs, trees, not bad looking at all, except for mounds everywhere. Mounds with plaques that read, here lie a thousand, here lie 2,500. These are the mass graves of our people. We also went to my former hometown of Hoya, near Hanover, and they were greeted by public officials who apologized over and over again. And then there was a young non-Jewish couple born after the war who took us to the Jewish cemetery, which was in terrible disarray, had not been cared for since 1938, took us to our family plot, and there among the top of the stones was a brand new shiny granite footstone with the ins inscription, Zur Erinnerung an die zerstörte Grabstelle der Familie Blumenthal, Hoya 1894 bis 1938. In memory of the desecrated plot of the Blumenthal family, Hoya 1894 to 1938, placed there by this non Jewish young couple, unbeknownst to us, a most beautiful, generous, kind gesture. Never thought that I would refer to non-Jewish Germans in such glowing terms. It's people like these that renew one's faith in humanity and they become dear, dear friends of ours. And we returned several times, a total of eight times at least, and I speak, when I return, speak at schools and universities and churches, do so in German. Tremendously well received, but so difficult for today's young people to hear in that country. After all, all of this happened by their own grandparents and great grandparent generation. Huge burden for these young people. And unfortunately, it will be their burden for generations to come. And then a few years ago, uh, we returned because a brand new public High school in my former hometown was named in my honor. So now we have the Mario Blumenthal Overschule in Hoya. Tremendous celebration and very courageous for this little town to redress what happened so many years ago in their midst. And the night before the celebration, we commemorated the night of broken glass on the site where our synagogue once stood. Difficult trips, yes, but no regrets having returned. I have a website, you have to bear with me. I know I 
should have think that you might have questions, but afterwards there's a reception and I'll be able to answer questions then. Uh, right, because I don't have that much time, Miss Stanton, right? Okay, okay. okay. Um, I have a website, this is important. It's called fourperfectpebbles.com. The thing is the computer guy, but I do want you to know I've got this thing, website. Okay, it has a front page. And, Oh, my front page is called a home page. <laughs> and it has a thing in the middle or someplace. It's called an icon. And it's. It, okay. My red icon, I, my icon is red. Okay. So it's, it's red. Always red, right? Okay. So if you push it, select is a better term. I learned that already. Right? Okay. If you do that and you see a video pertaining to the naming of the school, it's German and you subtitled, check it out. It is quite good. And then I have a Facebook. I do have this Facebook. And, and I was told to tell you that you should come and visit it. And like it. You should like it. Okay. <laughs> but to be serious once again, please, please use this wonderful technology and social media for good only. Do not disparage others. Do not intimidate others. Do not embarrass your friends. Be kind and good and respectful towards one another, please. September 11, 2001. None of us, none of us will ever be allowed to forget that day as long as we live. At that time, Nathaniel and I were in Florida visiting children and grandchildren. And because all planes were grounded, we chose to drive home. And as we approached New York and crossed the Verrazano Bridge amidst the smoking ruins of the Twin Towers, we could see the Statue of Liberty holding high the torch of freedom. It is that flame of freedom that the terrorists sought to destroy. But they could not, and they never will because we will take good care of our freedom. We will safeguard our freedom. We will not and must not take our freedom for granted. Let us all, each and every one of us, redouble our efforts to be kind and good towards one another. And with that, I wish each and every one of you a healthy, happy, productive future in a world of love and peace. by John Hall from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and some by an 11-year-old girl by the name of Lyric. Listen to the lyrics, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll be put on the screen. Project is better than that.
and again, Mr. Stanton, Mr. Connor, and Mr. Macabella, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have been with you this evening. Thank you.